Okay, good morning everybody and welcome to the first Cabinet meeting of 2023. A happy new year to all councillors, uh, staff, partners and uh, residents. Um, we'll move on to item one of the agenda then, which is apologies for absence. I believe we have one, which is councillor Andrew Burford. Thank you very much. Uh, there have been none others. I will move on to declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? Uh, no. Item three then are the minutes of the previous meeting, which have been circulated to pages three to six in the pack. I'll be happy to accept Move those. Them, Thank you very much. Uh, item four um, is uh, leaders' announcements. Uh, given today's meeting is relating, relating to the budget, um, I'll move uh, to uh, the, uh, uh, the the main business on the agenda. Item five is the monitoring report uh, for 22-23. Councillor Roy Evans. Apologies for that. I have just amused. No, it's fine. <laughs> uh, cabinet, uh, Tilford and Rekin has not been immune to the extreme financial challenges of 22-23. Soaring inflation has increased the cost of providing services. At the same time, the cost of living crisis has increased public demand for some services. These pressures, to, together with CPI inflation currently at 11.1%, have impacted on costs across all of our services including energy bills, care provider costs, and transport costs, all of which were unknown when the budget was set. Further, some impacts of COVID have continued into 22-23, such as in children's services. However, unlike previous years, there is no additional government funding to meet these costs. Before application of contingencies, including in the overall revenue budget, the projected output term position is currently expected to be over budget by just under 4.6 million at year end, an increase of 1.3 million since the last report. This will require the majority of budgeted contingencies to be used to fund the in-year position, which would leave the council with just £36,000 of contingency by year end. The main areas of financial pressure continue to be in the delivery of adult social care and children's safeguarding and family support. Cabinet members and budget holders will, of course, continue their work to manage budgets as effectively as possible and are actively implementing actions to address the in-year financial pressures. The eventual outturn, term, of course, could be better or worse, as spends, but spends will be updated as will projections refined. There are clearly a number of variations from the approved budget. Projections will be con continue to be refined. The capital programme totals 87 million for 22-23, which includes all approvals since the budget was set. Schemes are in progress, and at the time of compiling this report, projected spend was 98% of the budget allocation. <coughs> Income collected in relation to business rates is ahead of target, while council tax and sales ledger are currently slightly behind the target set. Ultimately, all debt will of course be pursued and collected after the year end if necessary and appropriate. Cabinet, you are asked to approve the recommendations set out at section one of the report. Thank you. Ray, is that seconded? Thank you very much. Any comments or questions from the members of the Cabinet in regards to the financial monitoring report before we move on to the budget? Paul? Yeah, it's a positive report and I want to thank the team again for the extreme <laughs> hard work that they the year really to, to, to get to this to this point and again we can see the effects of, of um, was it the Prime Minister who said that they'd sorted had on social care no it was the Prime Minister before no hold on it was the Prime Minister before that who said um, that they'd sorted social adult social care and unfortunately they haven't and we can see the effect of that uh, on our budgets regularly so uh, until we get that sorted by central government, and it can only be sorted by central government, I think we're going to be under pressure continuously, um, and uh, I would want to see that as soon as possible. But uh, again, thanks to the to the team for a, a, a good report. Thank you very much. Questions or comments from uh, group leaders, Bill? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to give my thanks to the finance team for what they have to do to try and balance the budgets. But I think they'll appreciate as well as I do that. They manage the numbers, but it's all the other departments working together as a team to try and keep the costs, a lid on the costs. But you can't keep a lid on a cost where you've got vulnerable people in front of you and their needs are more paramount than our budget. So I'm happy in many respects 
that we are having to spend more on adult and children's social services to look after those who most need it. And whenever you get government ministers saying, you know, we've got to have a smaller, a smaller sort of government sector, you think, well, hang on a minute, does that mean less for social care? And it just frightens you when they say things like that. So I'm grateful for what this authority is doing, but it really does point the way forward. Nothing's getting any easier for the next few years. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew, any comments at all? Um, no, I mean, I've made my views pretty clear on uh, the funding of adult social care by central government on a number of occasions. And it's not, not just this government or the government before or whatever. It's government's full stop that haven't uh, addressed this. <coughs> and the sooner it is addressed, obviously, the better, because the impact on local government finance mm. is, is immense, as we can see. And every year we come back to the same point with, with a huge understep. And clearly, you know, at some point, that, that really has to be stopped and that metal grasped. And the sooner that's stopped, I think, the better. Thank you. Um, Ray, anything from yourself? Mm -hmm. Well, I just want to just say that in terms of adult social care and also safeguarding of children, actually, the two things are linked. Clearly, to the paper in front of us is relating to council finances, but the impact upon real people's lives of the underfunding is immense, and also the impact upon the NHS is immense of, of, of yeah. both those services being underfunded. And you only have to go to your uh, local A&E department to see the awful, awful situation of people waiting 30 hours uh, in, the a in an A&E corridor, having already waited 20 hours to get an ambulance to them. Uh, the system is broken, and, and I don't remember under the last Labour government uh, people waiting 24 hours to get an um, a, a ambulance. 24 hours in A&E used to be a TV programme, uh, now it's the reality of both people um, um, interacting with the NHS, that's as a result of 12 years, five Conservative Prime Ministers who have broken the NHS. I am really concerned that there are Conservative politicians locally talking about um, now is the time to look at other, other options of, uh, of an NHS. Well actually no, we don't want a, another option to the NHS, the NHS worked uh, very, very well under the last Labour government, uh, what we needed is investment and reform. Um, to ensure that the NHS works for all. It's been moved, it's been seconded. All those in favour? That's unanimous, thank you very much. We'll now move on then to the main item of today's business in many ways, which is item six, which is the, uh, the budget. Uh, Councillor Ray Evans. Uh, thank you, Linda. Uh, and before I speak to this pa paper, uh, can I thank all of the officers and indeed cabinet members who have worked so hard on producing such an excellent piece of work um, it's something we expect each year to come round, but it takes a lot of work, and a lot of it is crammed into the last couple of weeks of the year. So thank you to everybody. Cabinet, our um, medium-term financial strategy is the financial expression of our priorities. Through the development of a sound financial strategy, we maximise the use of revenue and capital resources and ensure that we allocate the available funding in the best way to deliver our vision to protect, care and invest to create a better borough. You will recall that the current strategy, which covered a four-year period to 25-26, <coughs> was approved by full council on the 3rd of March 22. This report sets out our strategy covering the period 23-24 through to 26-27. Although due to high levels of uncertainty and the provisional one-year settlement from the government, Projections beyond next year can, of course, only be indicative. Like many other councils, we have experienced significant pressures arising from increasing costs and increasing demands for services, particularly those that we delivered for the most vulnerable <coughs> adults and children in our borough. The very tight national government funding position, current high rates of inflation, and the significant costs of living pressures which our residents are play, play, facing, higher interest rates together with major uncertainties over the future economic outlook create the context within which we should now consider these proposals. In recent years, the government has cut funding for local authorities, introduced the adult social care precept, and assumed that councils would increase council tax by the maximum permitted. The government's decision to increase the limit for council tax increases to 5% is a continuation of their policy of shifting the burden of funding local government services 
to our council taxpayers, regardless of their ability to fund these increases. However, despite the current high levels of financial pressure and uncertainty facing the council, this budget recognises the very real financial pressures being experienced by many of our residents. As a com compassionate council, on the side of our residents, we will not be the ones to look away at a time of financial crisis for many. These proposals therefore reaffirm the commitment given by full council last year to freeze the general council tax in recognition of the cost of living emergency facing our residents and also contains details of a £12 million cost of living crisis package. This council has consistently said that it will continue to protect the most vulnerable in our borough and prioritise the protection, protection of services to vulnerable adults and children. And the council remains committed to ensuring that we will always meet the assessed needs of such vulnerable people. Given the con continuing pressures on our services for vulnerable adults, we have little choice therefore but to apply the government's 2% adult social care preset next year which will raise just under 1.6 million towards the 7.2 million additional investment that's required to deliver our adult social care services. <coughs> for, a band of, uh, for the average band of B property, this will be an additional cost of 43 pence per week. And even after this increase, the council still expects to continue to have the lowest council tax in the Midlands region, and one of the lowest amongst all unitary authorities in England for the services that we provide. As well as the 7.2 million additional net ongoing investment into adult social care, our proposals also make provision for additional net <coughs> investment into children's safeguarding of 2.5 million. This means that next year the council's net budget for children's safeguarding will be over 41 million pounds. And for adult social care, the net budget will be £61.6 .6 million, giving a total commitment to these two key areas over, of over £103 million, equivalent to over two-thirds of the total net budget of this council. This council has an ambitious four-year investment programme to protect, care and invest to build a better borough. And we're committed to building a better future for our residents, communities and our businesses. To this end, we are proposing a medium-term capital investment programme totalling £364 million between 20, which, is, which started in 2020 and will continue through to 2024. We'll be, in, we'll be investing more than £50 million to keep our neighbourhoods safe, clean and well connected. On top of this, we will continue with our £16 million package of investment in projects that will make the borough cleaner, greener, safer and more enjoyable. The Council is also committed to continuing to deliver its On Your Side investment programme, which includes both revenue and capital schemes totalling £23.6 million over the period 22 to 26. In order to achieve these proposals, we have and will continue to need to make savings. This report contains details of our approaches to identifying savings opportunities, and puts forward new proposals that will deliver ongoing savings of almost £8 million during 23-24. Our plans for the future, as agreed by Cabinet in February, are centred on tackling the inequalities that exist within our community. We will continue to support residents and businesses to recover from COVID-19 pandemic and through the cost of living crisis. And we will attract new jobs and investment and promote clean growth in the borough <laughs> while seeking to project priority front seeking to protect for priority frontline services. This administration's proposal to minimise council tax for our residents at this challenging time is only possible due to our strong track record of financial management and our commitment to ensuring that can this council is as effective as possible and as efficient as possible. Locally, in the face of increasing demands for key services, while sustaining cuts in our funding from the government, cabinet members and offices have exercised strict budget management and financial control across the council. 
Indeed, this council has demonstrated a consistently strong track record of sound financial management, delivering a financial outturn within budget over the last 15 years, despite having delivered £141 million worth of ongoing ad ad annual budget savings since 2009. Cabinet, we are on the side of our residents, and it is sound fi financial management it means that the council tax for the services that this that Telford and Regan Council provides is the second lowest out of all English U3 authorities and remains the lowest in both the East and West Midlands. Currently, on average, council tax in the Midlands is almost 16% higher than in our borough. And even after the proposed 2% adult social colour levy, levy is likely to remain so. Cabinet, you're asked to support the recommendations contained in section one of the report. Following your approval, a consultation period on the proposals will run from the 6th of January through to the 5th of February. This will include meetings with representatives of our voluntary and business sectors, as, with, as well as with our town and parish councils. In addition, the Business and Finance Scrutiny Committee will scrutinise the administration's budget proposals and any alternative budget proposals that may be put forward by the opposition groups. Cabinet, I move. Thank you. Ray, is that seconded? Second, Thank you. Richard? Uh, yeah, can I, I mean, as we all know, the government with their mini budget um, caused a massive downturn in the economy and cost the country billions of pounds. And we, we all know, as Ray just said, that this has caused increased inflation and rising costs affecting our residents, businesses and, of course, services provided by local councils. The increased pressures and increased costs means that the next years will be increasingly difficult for all local authorities. But we know that despite these pressures, we have a duty to continue to deliver for our residents. And despite £141 million of savings, we have done all we can as a Labour Council to make sure that we have protected, cared for and invested in our communities. That is why I am proud that through this financial strategy we will continue to invest to expand New Place and Telford Weekend Homes, providing further high quality homes for local people and the security residents need to have the knowledge that they are renting from a responsible and responsive landlord. £10 million in the budget into affordable and specialist housing and added investment to other housing initiatives that include affordable warmth and reducing empty homes in our borough. We'll also be investing in transport and highway schemes as well as making sure that the, through the on-your-side investment, enforcement continues to be on the forefront of making sure our borough is cleaner, greener, cleaner and safer. I am proud that despite the issues ahead, we have a financial strategy that continues to deliver for our residents. And that's why I second this proposal. Thank you. Lee? Yeah, I'm, I'm proud to support this um, uh, pay for this budget. Um, when we look around, it feels that everything in the country is broken, and it's been broken by a Conservative government. They've broken the NHS, they've broken the rail service, they've broken the postal service. Um, they've even broken some councils, including some of their own Conservative councils. But the one thing that they won't break is Telford and Reeking Council, and that's because, once again, we've produced a pragmatic and a positive financial plan. Times are tough, but effectively what this is saying to our residents is that we are with you. We're with you during these tough times and we'll continue to be with you, whether that's a council tax freeze, the second year which uh, we've confirmed today. And also I'd like to um, praise Labour Town and, uh, Town and Parish Councils across the, um, the patch who've also um, urged their town councils and supported um, zero precept increases across the towns and parishes as well. Or whether that's a range of cost of living support that we've announced recently with very little extra support from government to support those initiatives. It didn't have to be like that. Um, people say it was a Ukraine conflict, they'll say it was a Covid pandemic, but actually what they're overlooking when they say that was a £74 billion hit that Quasi Quarteng and Liz Trust delivered to the country, equivalent to £4,000 every household in Telford and Reekin, um, when they delivered their gamble budget in September, their mini budget in September. Um, so if we look at the positive, we'll continue to invest in our local highways, into our local roads, into our local footpaths, our local structures, new street lighting, new cycleways, safer routes to school, increased road safety, despite the fact that the Department of Transport have cut over £4 million from our budgets over the last two years. Community action teams, another thing that we've invested in, in 13 different areas across Telford and Regan to make sure every neighbourhood is kept clean, tidy and well maintained. 
if we look at this budget and the proposals it sets out for investment into high streets where we'll continue to invest and support startup businesses, help businesses expand, help them diversify. Already that programme has seen over 60 businesses, new events, relaunch of a Telford loyalty card, secured four post offices in the borough when they were at risk of being lost and created new jobs in every high street across Telford and Reekin. When we look at the regeneration plans, Station Quarter being a, an example of that, but also regeneration plans in uh, Wellington and Oak and Gates. Um, the only thing that's hindering us there really is delay by government in getting that money to us, making announcements three years before the money's ready to be handed over. Look at the impact inflation has had on those pots alone. Um, we've seen it in other areas as well, Department of Transport announcements on investment into uh, places like Wellington train station announced in 2019 still not delivered inflation is going to take a massive hit on that on that fund and probably a project will be delivered there that's less than we could have delivered four years ago so we're not being helped but we're still being positive and pragmatic and then we come on to the capital program and I know that's a bone of contention but actually it's a really positive thing a very positive thing because nearly or over two thirds of that income is generating millions of pounds of income into this council that helps support the services that matter most to residents. So actually all of that is a very, very, very positive outlook in what are really, really tough times. And as again, I repeat that message, really tough times, but we are with our residents and will continue to do what is most important to them. And I'm really proud to support this budget. Thank you. Carolyn. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, as it, both in this report and the previous report, the, the word uncertain and uncertainty is, is used a lot, isn't it? And um, I, mean, I won't go over the points that, that Councillor Carter's made around the disastrous decisions of this government, not just the, the you know, the, the sort of recent one with the mini budget, but, but really since 2011. I mean, 133.7 million already stripped out of, of our budget, with another 7.9 million. Uh, outlined in this report and and for what you know that austerity was meant to reduce national debt national debt has never been higher um, and yet despite that inequality has grown we haven't improved that debt hasn't improved people's outcomes it's improved it for a few at the top you know we would never have more billionaires but people at the very bottom can't afford toothpaste for their children and this is it's dickensian it's 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 just outrageous um, and now the government is is passing more of that burden onto local councils that then to then raise council tax to pass that on to residents who can ill afford uh, those increased bills. Um, so, you know, despite all of the challenges, I'm pleased that we are on the side of our residents, that we recognise that there is a cost of living crisis, that council tax is a, a, a big bill for quite a lot of our households. And so I, I fully support the, the freeze in the general council tax. I think that's absolutely the right thing to do and shows that we are on the side of our residents. And, and I also welcome you know, the many initiatives that have happened through the last 10 years but are outlined in this report for um, projects going forward where we continue to work in partnership um, with, with, our, with our communities and with our voluntary sector and other uh, and, and businesses um, and, and you know, to make sure that we've got services retained, that more commercial focus so that we're bringing in that income to support frontline services. So we are very fortunate in Telford Reading that despite all of those challenges, we still have libraries serving our communities. Mm. You know, we don't charge things like wheelie bins. Over Christmas, I was in Wigan at my dad's, and um, he was telling me about how there been a spate of wheelie bin thefts because you have to pay for your wheelie bin in Wigan, <laughs> and um, so people start stealing them when when they need a replacement one. Um, you know, we've got excellent leisure centres, we've got award-winning parks, and we're still investing. Uh, money in addressing the climate change challenge despite the fact that this government is squeezing so hard and putting more and more pressure um, on, on local government and not stepping up on these issues um, and I know that we'll do all we can you know, to do our best to deliver this the full range of services for our residents uh, because that's what they deserve. This government might not be on the side of our residents but we are. Thank you Karen. Kelly? Thank you. Um, I support this uh, budget also um, in terms of health and wellbeing. I mean, I think it's got to be said that our teams in health and health protection uh, did an outstanding job protecting us during the COVID pandemic in extremely difficult and sustained period of circumstances. Uh, the fact that we was able to to do so much so quickly was was absolutely outstanding. And you know, with the COVID pandemic, people's need for services in public health increased hugely. 
impacting on mental health, loneliness, <coughs> substance misuse, all those public health things, and <coughs> the the growth of need of service is huge and has continued to do so. So, in terms of public health, I think we haven't really seen yet the impact of that across the borough. Um, I think it's just slowly starting to sort of unfold. Um, leisure services continue to support residents' health and wellbeing and provide brilliant facilities and services. I think we're really lucky in Telford and Rekin. Our investment into them has really paid off and we're doing a lot of great work for residents. Um, and the cost of living crisis had a vast impact on people's health and wellbeing and widens health inequality, but I feel our offer is outstanding. Uh, the, what we offer our residents and the support we give them is brilliant. Yes, yeah, so I really support this and thank you. Thank you. It's, it's like, where do you start? I don't want to repeat everything my colleagues have said, but it's like, in spite of what will be 141 million of cuts, we still have got the lowest council tax in the East and West Midlands, and it's been frozen for two years, and I think we're about the only authority that can say that. And that's in spite of the massive cuts we've had around. Our priorities will always still be to protect, care and invest to create a better borough. And that is how we are supporting our residents. And the only thing that I feel has grown under this Conservative government is the growth in food banks, baby banks, warm coats and shoe schemes to put coats on our, and shoes for our children to go to school. We're having to provide warm banks for people to go and sit in because they can't afford to put their heating on at home. How a government can be proud of that record. And I listened yesterday and I just wanted to say, do you not realise it's your government that's been in power for 12 years? The comments you are making, the issues you are discussing, they're of your own making. What this country needs, and needs really, really quickly, <coughs> is a Labour government so we can actually return our NHS to where it was when we left that in 2011 with waiting times of four hours we thought were terrible. If that came on the board and you'd been sitting waiting to be discharged within four hours, that flagged up as red. Not now, 24 hours, and you still haven't got your ambulance. But we know, as an individual, to have no long-term planning by the government, to say it isn't helpful is the least. Even in our own households, we need some stability. We need to plan for our future. You only need to look at the effect that the concerns are having across the country of the unknowns about the cost of energy costs on families. Families are worried sick, they can't plan, they don't know where to turn. So for local authorities across the country to have absolutely no idea of what the financial planning is going to be beyond this year, it used to be a three year planning cycle. When I was an officer here, it was at least a three to five year planning cycle. The autumn statement came in the autumn. I won't ask Ken and embarrass him, but I bet you didn't get your figures in the autumn. I would imagine that had been right on Christmas. So our officers have had to work all over the Christmas period to prepare the report to make sure we can have that planning in place for our budget. So, I mean, I just want to say in light of all of that, and I won't repeat what's been said, but I will just look at my own area. In spite of all of those cuts, I am so proud that we're investing another 40 million in education capital projects, providing the best educational facilities across the country. If you, we have people come to visit our town, people want to live in our town, and one of the things they comment on is the state of our school estates. It is outstanding, and that is because of the investments we've made. We're also putting, and you, to me, I can't put a price on this, but the fact that my colleagues are prepared to put another 2.5 million investment into children's safeguarding, which we all hold so dear when we know to our hearts, in the times that we're in, we've got a budget of 41.6 million for children's safeguarding. That is a massive part of our budget. I think as um, Councillor Evans said before, two thirds of the budget is adult social care and children's safeguarding. What does that allow us to use for the rest? But if you look at our record of what we're providing with the rest, it's amazing. Our 10 by 10 investment for children, 200,000 that's going to ensure that our young people have the opportunities that they should have. Under this cost of living crisis, most of these families cannot afford it. Our free swimming lessons, that is amazing. Over 350 families have already benefited from that scheme. This is how we show we are on the side of our residents. It's not fancy slogans, it's actual <coughs> actions, words and deeds that we do. 
We are on the side of our residents and we will continue to be so. I'm very proud of this budget and I fully support it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we'll move over to group leaders for any comments or questions. Um, yeah. um, I'm still okay. going to go through the, re the report itself as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, I've had a high level briefing on, on it uh, but need to sit down and go through it okay. in some detail. Bill? Yeah, the, the big complaint which I think Shirley raised as well is the fact we get things so light. Obviously for us we can't read the budget too well because we only had it yesterday so we got the detail to go through but my sympathies go with all the officers and the team here who probably got it so late and, and in terms of trying to plan it's, it's bonkers you, you know we're, at, what, what we're spending over 100 million pounds a year and you don't know what the major part of your money is going to be for the government grants and what's expected until just before Christmas then you've got to have this cabinet meeting then you've got to go through the consultation process then you've got to have the vote and to try and pull all that together is to be boring. And in terms of planning for local authorities, when they don't really know, A, what's going to come up next year, and even though we put a three-year strategy on, we haven't got a clue what they're going to come up with, except you have to expect almost less again in the following years. So the knee-jerk reactions that this government are doing, and have been doing for years and years now, just shows you if you're knee-jerking, you're not in control you're not sensibly looking through what the real issues are and thinking what is the fairest and best way to deliver that and it, it's symptomatic of all that they do how can you say and make announcements of we're going to long term plan on the NHS when the NHS is crumbling beneath us and it should have had a plan put in year or two, three, four <coughs> years ago to prevent this so on the face of it um, with a nil increase on the general council tax it is disappointing we're still having to put 2% to cover adult social services, which we hoped to have got from the government. Um, on the face of it, we'd support that, but without seeing all the detail, it's difficult to make that decision. Thank you. It's really, it's really hard to run councils, and it's really hard to run councils when you haven't got a government on the side of councils, and a government that is not on the side of communities and uh, residents across uh, Telford Reek and, and indeed across uh, the country. And you can't, when you run a council, you can't just uh, be blind to reports you read it overnight um, and you have to get your head around the detail of reports you can't just abdicate uh, responsibility um, and but take the special responsibility allowance for uh, being a leader of an opposition group um, and not do the reading and not do the response uh, this Labour Council has overseen a decade or more of uh, being on the side of our residents, investing and believing and having confidence in Telford and Rekin. At a time that residents in Telford and Rekin have sent more money in taxation to uh, Whitehall and had, more, uh, had less back every single year. 70% the highest tax burden in 70 years uh, as a result of a Conservative government, yet the lowest investment in public services and council services uh, for 70 years. Contrast that with the Labour-controlled council here in Telford and Rekin. The lowest council tax in the region for the last five years. The second lowest uh, council tax of all unitary uh, authorities across uh, the country uh, again. The only council in the country to freeze council tax uh, l uh, this year uh, and at uh, last, uh, despite the fact that the Conservatives here in Telford and Rekin voted against uh, that council tax uh, freeze, wanting to put council tax up, uh, just like the Police and Crime Commissioner what, um, uh, increases uh, council tax each and every time, just like the Conservative-led fire authority that puts council tax each and every time, because it's easy for Conservative uh, politicians to keep raiding the pockets of residents uh, in Telford and Rekin. They raid uh, the pockets of uh, of uh, the pockets of Telford and Rican residents when it comes to general taxation, uh, it's the highest in 70 years. They raid when it comes to um, uh, inflation um, busting increases uh, when inflation was normal by the Police and Crime Commissioner and the, the Fire Authority. And if you're structure, um, uh, Tory control structure council, you raid uh, people's uh, res uh, residents' uh, uh, pockets each and every year and yet deliver abysmal services. Contrast that with Labour uh, uh, Council. Labour on the side of our residents, not only investing in today, investing in services today, outstanding children's services, exceptional 
adult social care services, some of the best roads uh, in the country. Uh, contrast that when the Conservatives were in control of the council, and the AA said that we had the worst roads uh, in the country uh, um, uh, um, uh, as a result of uh, four years of Conservative rule. And I remember when, we, when I was first elected to Telford and Regan Council in 2011, when we, I was told that we were asset poor, we were an asset poor council. We've now, as a result of the decisions that we've made, got uh, over half a billion pounds worth of assets. Uh, not just, not for me, not for Labour councillors, but for the future generations of Telford and Rican residents that they can rely upon, that they can use, that they, they, they can enjoy. Um, and um, the, uh, the way I describe it to residents is a bit like having a mortgage, really. If you've got um, a, um, a house that you own um, and, you, and you own 50% of that house, um, then that's a that's a very good deal. But unlike a mortgage, councils this council gets f uh, the asset. We own half of it when you take away the, 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 the net co cost of borrowing. But each and every asset that we have, or almost uh, all, apart from our roads, of course, pay us back a uh, rent and, 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 and an income generation, uh, which is really important. My only regret uh, over the last 11 years is that we've not had a Labour government in control of, of the country and what we do need now is a decade of renewal uh, from a Labour government moving away from sticking sticking plaster politics spotting icebergs and going around them rather than not spotting them at all and going into them or even worse spotting them and still going into them <laughs> uh, which is what's happened uh, with so many uh, crises of the uh, of the country but I do do a, I, I do a direct appeal today to the Conservative Police and Crime Commissioner to the Conservative led fire authority and to every parish and town council here in Telford and Rekin, follow Telford and Rekin Council's lead, freeze your proportion of the council tax, stop raiding the pockets of Telford and Rekin residents who can ill afford uh, to pay more council tax um, on their bill um, at, at a time when they are already paying the greatest tax burden in 70 years. Um, and I used to say that the council tax was the second biggest uh, bill for most people in Telford and Rican after their rent or their mortgage. It's now the third or fourth actually after after, after looking at energy bills. Uh, we need uh, um, um, our, our decision makers to make the tough decisions to reform and to challenge their own organisations so that their own organisations are making efficiencies and not to go to the lever of asking <laughs> residents to pay more. So if your council tax goes up uh, this year, uh, residents of Telford and Rican, it will be because of a police and crime commissioner who's a Conservative, a Conservative-led fire authority, parish or town councils who are not following the uh, direct appeal of this council, or as a result of the government-imposed adult social care uh, precepts. Uh, all the other elements of your council tax are frozen and are the lowest level uh, there anywhere else in the country bar one. And that's a record that I'm proud of. It's been moved, it's been seconded. Ray, do you want to come back yeah, for me? I would me? just like to say that, uh, Leader, I may, Tomorrow we move into a period of consultation and I've described the avenues through which feedback can be provided. Can I appeal to those members of the opposition who may have plans for better ideas um, to make sure that they come through the right channels? Don't leave it to the night of full council when this budget is being put to full council for movement. That doesn't provide time to consider your ideas. And there is, we do have a track record of listening to ideas that have come forward. Uh, Councillor Thompson will remember, he came to me and said, I'm concerned about this. Uh, and it was those most vulnerable in our society, how are they going to be supported? And we managed to change the budget, and we did change the budget, to accommodate that request. So my request is, if you have ideas for improving this budget, please channel them through the correct process. That way they can be fully considered and possibly incorporated. Thank you, uh, Ray. That's been moved, it's been seconded. Everyone in favour? That's everybody. Um, in, thank you very much. Okay then, we're now, thank you, Ken. We'll now then move on to item seven, which is the affordable warmth strategy, um, our action plan update. Uh, Richard Overton. Uh, thank you, Sean. This report cabinet is to provide an update on our affordable warmth strategy, which we started in 2021. Our key aims were to reduce the number of fuel poor households, improve the health and well-being of the most vulnerable and close the gap by targeting the highest levels of fuel poverty and addressing inequalities. As a council we developed an action plan and also looked for external funding opportunities. 
So the Telford Energy Advice Hotline, we've supported thousands of households in the borough, including home visits, safer, stronger events, schools and training, and the next steps are to provide funding to top up the Energy Advice Service to provide additional resources to run the hotline and to work with the plan builder. Through bidding our external funding opportunities, we have managed to attract four million of grant funding into the borough. This has been through LAD2 funding, which was our Sutton Hill programme of retrofitting 50 homes with over 70 measures. LAD3 funding to Donington and Borough Wire, which was 150 of on-off gas homes, and used our climate change money to retrofit 12 temporary accommodation properties. The strategy will continue to deliver and develop as we know the current fuel poverty gap and the current energy prices cause more people to feel, fall into fuel poverty. Our next steps are through the HUG2 funded to retrofit programme for 100 off-gas properties over the next two years and also to use our own climate change programme to assist residents through LED light bulbs, emergency boiler funds uh, for vulnerable households and retrofit programmes for households out of scope for government funding. We will also continue to maximise our work and improve the local economy by continuing our partnership working with Citizens Advice, MEA, social landlords and private landlords. We are keen to keep spend local, supporting businesses, local suppliers and we are also working on home improvement loans and how to address the skill shortage in insulation and retrofit. We all know the work we are doing is vital but more needs to be done by this government to reach even more people and to help us reduce fuel poverty across our borough. I move the recommendations in the report. Thank you. Is that seconded? Any questions or comments from members of the Cabinet, Caroline? Yeah, um, I mean, the report says, so I slightly disagree with one land report, which sort of says about the, the dramatic rise in energy prices driven by the war in Ukraine. I'd say that's only part of the reason, actually. We were much more exposed in the UK than our European neighbours, whose prices have not risen anywhere near as high. Um, due to our, our high dependency on, on gas imports, our lack of gas storage, which was a Liz Truss decision um, to remove that, our lack of investment in, in renewables and nuclear, um, and poorly insulated housing stock that, again, hasn't been uh, addressed. I mean, you might disagree with the tactics of people like Insulate Britain, but the point is, is certainly valid. Um, wholesale gas prices have actually now come down, but um, private energy companies uh, are not passing those savings on, they're banking their windfall profits, and this is something that government could do something about, but they choose not to. Um, so once again, local councils, this council in particular, are stepping in where national policy has failed to support our residents. Um, so I'm really proud of the work that's been delivered as part of this strategy. Some of my residents have, have used the Energy Advice Service and found it extremely helpful. Um, so I welcome the extension of that service. Um, certainly welcome the development of the plan builder tools to give people the advice and help them navigate that minefield really in terms of trying to think about how you make your house more energy efficient and transition to cleaner um, energy sources. Um, and, and this isn't just a cost of living <coughs> issue as, as Councillor Robertson uh, explained, it is a climate change issue too um, and the provision of further funding from the climate change capital fund to improve energy efficiency in homes um, helping residents and the planet at the same time is, is, is really welcome. You know, this is the sort of thing actually that, that government should be doing across the board um, and, 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 and they aren't. I mean, the Eco Plus grant, yeah, that does come from government and that is a good start, you know, I'll acknowledge that, but it is just a start and much, much more needs to be done and much more quickly, uh, both to ensure that people don't need to choose between, between heating and eating, um, but also to ensure that we meet those climate change targets um, and we ensure a positive future for our children. So, you know, I welcome what we're doing locally, but I would like to see much more from government. Absolutely. Thank you. Kelly? Thank you. Um, it's great to see uh, that this strategy is tackling inequalities and aims to improve residents' health and wellbeing and is showing they live in a warm and comfortable home. I think it's really important for improving health and wellbeing of our residents, particularly the most vulnerable in our community, which is probably just everybody at the moment, even if you work, isn't it? I think. Uh, and fits well with one of our priorities about every child, young person, adult <coughs> as well in the community. And uh, the welfare offer outlined in our cost of living strategy is vital within this, I think, for our residents. And we do know that excessively cold environments have huge implications on the health of uh, all age groups. And what we also know is people are not likely to just put their heating on, which is a massive problem. So they're not going to take measures very often to in some areas to uh, reduce that but they just won't put it on which is going to have a knock-on effect uh, of all age groups and uh, during the cost of living this strategy is most needed I think so absolutely support this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Group leaders? Bill? Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> 
I welcome the report. Sorry. There's a report I read the other day that said up to it's a frightening figure. Up to a quarter of all households will not put the heating on at all through the winter. I mean that's just unbelievable. You, you mentioned decaying in. I mean you can't believe it really. <coughs> um, so I really welcome any any help that we can make. But very often what help we can give, although it's important, is often at the fringes. It's got to come from central government. And I know it was a Lib Dem policy we, we turned down, but insulating social housing, it's got to be a no-brainer. Retrofitting insulation where it's needed the most. And in social housing and, you know, those, those sectors, it's where people are desperately mo most in need. So that's where government should be putting its money. And insulation will then cut energy costs down. And whichever method you use to produce it, you need less of it. So that makes abundant sense. I also take the point that Carolyn Healy said about um, governments. It's not just this government. I think governments for decades now haven't properly and courageously and bravely took on the planning of energy production in this country. We've just relaxed and thought, oh, we've got gas and well, we can go and buy it from elsewhere. And they haven't had the courage to say, we've got to do something to make ourselves energy self-sufficient. So that should be at their foremost of their minds now. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew? <coughs> uh, well, I welcome any initiative, uh, certainly multi-agency, that starts to address this problem. Is it really is a worry. So the report itself, I, I you know, ab absolutely welcome. I think uh, the issue about uh, the price of g gas and the war in Ukraine is absolutely right. But you're also right; it's only part of the problem. And COVID actually contributed to that with the demand from Asia as soon as we came out of the uh, pandemic. That's what started to push prices up. And also companies have to buy gas and they buy it in bulk at a spot price and that needs to work through before the uh, drop in gas prices <coughs> is uh, reflected. Now the gas prices were, well, they were extortionately high at one point. Now they're still very high so there's a long way to go before we get on top of this particular problem. But I think anything that local authorities can do is, is absolutely right and what's in this uh, uh, report itself is to be welcomed and I I mean I for one have been to the warm spaces that uh, we put in place with uh, the council grant in Marlborough and they're well used a lot of people go but it's not only for warmth they're using it it's very much a social occasion the way that that's being built up as well so it's something else that uh, I do welcome in this. Thank you very much indeed um, it's been a good discussion I've been moved to second level in favour. So thank you very much thank you very much Okay, we'll move on to our last item on the agenda today, which is item eight, which is the Telf and Recon Schools funding formula. Shirley. Thank you, Peter. Uh, the report for the dedicated schools grant is allocated to local authorities by the Department for Education and is in four blocks. School block calculated using number of pupils at the preceding October census, and our allocation for 23 24 is 159 million. High needs block uses a combination of historic allocations <coughs> and the national funding formula for 23-24 we're getting 35 million. The early years block is calculated taking average pupils um, in the relevant two January sentences and multiplying that unit of funding. We will for 23-24 13.6 million. The central school services block again calculated with a mixture of historic expenditure levels and the number of pupils. This grant was introduced in 2018-19, replacing the Education Services Grant, but sadly at a much reduced level. Our 23-24 allocation is 1.1 million. Now, whilst funding is al always welcome, this has to be considered in context, and I ask you to note with great concern the removal of the Department of Education School Improvement Monitoring and Brokering Grant for maintained schools. Nationally, this amounts to a cut of £50 million to education for maintained schools. Academies aren't affected. No alternative funding has been provided, and this represents a cut to Telford and Reakin of 182000 we still have to carry out this function, but the government has now removed the funding which we use to carry it out. Furthermore, we also have to ask our maintained schools to de-delegate de funding for the national school improvement functions, which is nothing more than a cut to education funding for maintained schools. 
this is a bitter blow given all the support that both the local authority and our schools have given to the Department of Education over the last two years during the pandemic. How can this empower our education system to be the best it can for all of Telford's children, which is surely our collective ambition? High need funding pressures is increased, but this does not remove the, it, whilst we've got more funding, it has not removed the pressure on our budget. The increase in demand and pressures on budget is being felt by local authorities across the country. There is a national deficit of over two billion pounds, and I would urge the government to address this. Our administration continues to deliver an effective and cost-efficient provision whilst dealing with the fundamental pressures, which to a large extent is because it's a demand-led system, but this is thanks to the strong relationships that we've got with our schools and excellent financial monitoring. Since 2021, local authorities have been required to apply a minimum funding per pupil. For 23-24, this has been set at 4,405 for primary schools, and 5,715 for secondary schools. This has the impact of boosting the funding of schools with less deprived intakes, as these schools receive little funding from factors linked to deprivation and low prior attainment. It should be noted that funding for schools is also affected by the amount allocated to growth funding. <coughs> in Telford and Reekin, our schools continue to grow as planned, and we will ensure that our schools are not being disadvantaged by the government's formula. Schools who increase their pupil numbers will be funded straight away using estimated pupil numbers rather than the government's formulas where the schools have to wait until the following April if they're maintained or September for academies for the funding to reflect their pupil numbers. The national minimum funding guarantee assures a minimum increase per pupil compared to the previous year. For 23-24 this has to be set between 0% and 0.5. Our administration has proposed to adopt the highest possible level of funding allowed for our schools and we will be going for the 0.5%. We want to ensure that children across Telford and Reekin receive the best settlement and none of our schools experience a decrease in funding per pupil. The actual allocations to schools will be finalised once we've got the total information that's been released from the DfE only came in September and it's been worked into the local funding formula for Telford and Reekin. Therefore, approval is being sought for the principles behind the funding formula, which are mirroring the government's national funding formula, a guaranteed increase of per pupil of 0.5%, which is the maximum allowed by the government, supporting growth in schools by we will be using estimated pupil numbers to determine the funding to avoid any lag in money reaching schools. I want to thank Simon and his team, together with Ken and his team, for all their hard work, helping us to ensure that we're supporting our schools to enable our children and young people to achieve their true potential. We'll continue to protect care and invest in our young people's futures. I therefore move the recommendation and ask Cabinet to approve the 23-24 funding formula. Thank you very much. Uh, is that seconded? Yes. Thank you. Any comments or questions from members of the Cabinet? No, in which case, move to the group leaders. Anything from yourselves, Bill? Yes, um, I, I tried to read through the figures, and um, forgive me for this, Councillor Alves. I, I just wondered, could you educate me? Pardon the book. <laughs> could you educate me? We see the formulas and everything else, but in the next year, which these figures relate to, are the schools, which I know it's government money, we don't put the money in, it all comes from the government, will the money be sufficient to cover inflation in terms of energy costs? Um, uh, wage costs for teachers. Yeah. In other words, because yeah. what we what we know is if it isn't going to cover inflation, we'll end up with fewer teachers. We'll end up with less services. We'll end up with fewer books. So, could you could you outline what the overall picture is if you have got it, please? If you put this <coughs> in your own perspective at home, you are sitting there not knowing what your energy costs are going to be yeah. for a school. They rely very heavily just even on energy costs alone to run a school estate. Yeah. They are very mindful that they do not have the budget to cover those costs. I'm sure Simon and his team will be able to explain that we have got an awful lot of concerned heads across the whole of the borough who know that the money they are being given by government is not sufficient for the needs to run that school in the way that they would like to run it to give the best outcomes for our children. Now, I am absolutely 100%, as a teacher myself, 
family with teachers, I know that all the teachers and all the education staff across the authority will do absolutely everything they can to provide the best education and experience for children and they will cut the cloth according to what they have. But really, as I've already said once within my paper, I put a direct plea to the government, our education system needs more funding. I'm sure if it's actual figures, Simon may have those, but you must appreciate a lot of our schools are academies, so we don't have access to their financial information. We can only go by what they talk to us at primary heads, secondary heads. We know there's an awful lot of worried school staff out there who know they do not have the funds for what they wish to deliver. just spoke about around energy I mean well you know, the lack of ambition from the government so the energy prices is a massive issue for the public sector as a whole only the government are able to borrow at scale what why why is there not a national mission to retrofit every public service building with, with renewable energy which will help uh, the climate uh, emergency will help energy security will reduce bills for skill uh, schools so that they can spend that money elsewhere uh, the reality is we've got a government who lurch from one crisis to another crisis, lacking vision, lacking confidence, lacking ability, lacking ideas, um, and it all comes back to the cost of, uh, the, the failure cost demands, where people, the system is spe spending money on things that it really ought not to, which means that we, that we haven't got the money to do the things that we ought to be uh, doing with. It's, it's really frustrating. But anyway, on that frustrating note, it's been moved, it's been seconded. All those in favour? That's everybody, thank you very much, and that brings our first meeting to an end. Thank you very much for everyone's behaviour and conduct today, um, and uh, we are... Uh